Todd, I really appreciate you taking the time today to, uh, to, to talk. Of course, this is uh, part of the, uh, the Utah SharePoint Office 365 user group, our virtual SPUG uh, uh, meeting, and, and Todd's uh, uh, so gracious to uh, join us and to share some of his wisdom, even though it's just one level of learning. Yep, just to, not, just the first one. Yep. Not, not two levels. So if you came thinking, I'm going to you know, up my game by two levels. No, sorry. <laughs> not today. Not today. Better luck tomorrow. Well, maybe unintentionally. <laughs> it could, you know. But uh, with that, Todd, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, and uh, Well, let me just say that uh, if you do have questions, um, down at the bottom of uh, Zoom, if you're not familiar with it, uh, use the Q&A. Uh, I'll try to address them. Todd's got that open as well. If yep. there are other questions, technical difficulties you see, use the chat. Otherwise, all questions through the Q&A module. And we'll be tracking those. And Todd, did, we'll try to address those throughout, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I'll keep that open. Uh, my only request is, Mike Robbins, I see that you're watching. If I say something dumb, don't put that in the public chat. Send it to me privately so that I don't get embarrassed for everybody. <laughs> it's my only request. Uh, well, with that, uh, you know, Todd, I'm just going to turn it over to you and, and uh, right. let you uh, kick things off. All right. So like Christian said, this is all about PowerShell and Office 365. I do this session a lot and you're going to find out I actually did this session a week ago at a different conference. And so I'm using that same deck. Uh, this is a, a pretty common thing. I've been an IT pro for a lot of years now. I think I've, I've lost count of it, but I've used every version of SharePoint server in production. So starting with STS 2001 all the way up to 2019, have had them all. And with the Office 365 actually gaining some traction. You know, like 10 years ago, Microsoft said, hey, we're moving everything to Office 365. And it was like that scene in old school where Will Ferrell is, you know, we're shrieking the quad and he looks behind him and there's nobody there. That was kind of how the first uh, round of Office 365 adoption went. And then Microsoft regrouped a couple of years later and then Office 365 took off. And so guys like me were kind of worried and struggling to think about what our jobs were going to be like and what our career looked like. And I can't cook, so fast food was kind of out of the question. PowerShell is one of these things where this is where our, our admin career is going in Office 365. So I really like this session. I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. And hopefully it'll uh, open some stuff up for you guys as well. And let me get over here. All right, so this is me. Christian had a much more flattering picture of me on Twitter. If you're not on Twitter, you should go out there and view that because it's a it's like he's got... Uh, cameras in my house or something I was you know prepping a little bit before that it was is when you had the perm I and mean, that's the only downside but you thought you look good you look very cut yeah the, the perm the mustache I was much hairier there than I am now so I I'm a I'm SharePoint MVP or I guess now these days it's an office services and servers MVP or something I forget basically that just means it doesn't mean I'm the smartest guy in the room but it means I like to chat I like to help so if you're cruising around on the internet and you see that MVP badge on somebody's blog uh, no, there's somebody you can talk to that you can ask questions to. And I'll, I'm one of those people. So here's about 16 different ways to get a hold of me, email, Twitter, all of that, my blog. This slide deck is already out at that URL at the bottom. Again, I presented this last week. So you can go out there uh, right now and grab that follow along as I read aloud. You don't have to worry about taking notes and stuff because all the, the code will be out there. But I do writing, I do consulting. Most all of these examples are things that I've had to do for customers in the last uh, couple of years. So they're very uh, applicable things. I work at a consulting company, Simpraxis Consulting, with a couple of friends of mine, Mark Anderson, Julie Turner, and then we brought another guy on here a couple of months ago, Derek Cash Peterson. And those guys are mostly developers. They brought me on for some admin cred. And so I do a lot of these kind of little scripting one-off things while they're writing the fancy stuff. It's, uh, it's a pretty good place to be. And then SysKit, they write some tools. They write SP.Kit is their big claim to fame. They write some great security management tools. They're also moving into the Office 365 space. And I do a lot of things for them too. I'm doing a webinar next week for them on Microsoft or Office 365 groups. So if you don't have anything going on next week, you should sign up for that. It is also free and worth every penny. So I see no questions about my vanity slide, so we will move on. This is mostly a very bland agenda slide, I see that. We're going to talk about a, a few things, kind of break this down kind of in three chunks. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about the modules that Microsoft puts out for Office 365 and what you can do with those and when you would use those. 
that we're going to talk about the patterns and practices PowerShell, mostly because I really like alliteration and the letter P. And then finally, we will look at some scripts that I've uh, used for customers and little things to kind of get your creative juices flowing. When I first started doing PowerShell, it was when SharePoint 2010 was in beta. So we're coming up on 10 years ago. And I had been using STS ADM, which was Microsoft's command line tool at the time. Loving it. It was great. I was really good at it. When PowerShell first, when they announced, they're like, hey, we've got great news. SharePoint 2010 is going to come out with PowerShell. That's going to be the admin interface. I went through all these stages of grief because I'm just, I'm not smart enough for PowerShell, honestly. And so there was the anger and the bargaining, but I did finally move to acceptance. And once I did, it was, it was a great move. I've loved PowerShell ever since. And one of the things that I found is I, I can't learn PowerShell by looking at PowerShell books and things like that. What I need is some kind of inspiration. I need a task that I need to do or, or something like that. So hopefully those scripts I have at the end will kind of jiggle you with some ideas like, you know, I've always wanted a way to do blah. Looks like there's a way to do that. So that's kind of what those scripts at the end are. And then you can take them and, and do whatever with them. First, the official modules. I live in Ames, Iowa, and this is, uh, this is you know, just a shot outside my back window here. This is exactly what, uh, what Ames, Iowa looks like. So that's, uh, we got that. Okay, so before you can connect, um, I can't see the room, obviously, because uh, there's, you know, not everybody in the room. But I would guess that a lot of you are coming from the on-prem world. And hopefully you've used SharePoint and PowerShell, you know, together to get some things done. As with any sort of PowerShell, I like to talk about how the PowerShell for Office 365 or anything is the same but different. So you'll notice a lot of similarities. The things that you learned how to get around inside of PowerShell on SharePoint Server are similar to Office 365, but there are a bunch of differences. So I'm going to kind of talk about this here. The biggest one that really took me some getting used to is to remember that when I'm running PowerShell with SharePoint Server, I'm on the SharePoint Server and I'm interacting directly with the SharePoint object model. So that means there's no authentication issues because I've logged into the server. There's no network issues because I'm, I'm talking directly to the object model and it worked really well. When I start doing Office 365 stuff, obviously Office 365 is all in the cloud. So you've got network issues and then you can be logged into different things inside of Office 365 and as different users. So that took a little bit of getting, uh, getting my arms wrapped around. Before you can do the things that I'm going to talk about in the rest of this slide deck, here are kind of some uh, things you have to have set up ahead of time. Most all of these modules are going to tell you you need to be able to run your PowerShell module as an administrator. That is not strictly accurate. There are a few places that you cannot. But if you work in a place where IT has policies where you can't run as administrator, uh, then you're going to want to get that addressed and find out a way to be able to run PowerShell as administrator because you will run up against it, especially as you have to start installing modules. So that's just something to get uh, get set up ahead of time. In a lot of cases, you need to have administration, administrator roles inside of Office 365. This keeps changing as they keep adding more administrative roles to Office 365. When I first started doing this deck five years ago or whenever, you had to be a tenant admin, a global admin, and then they added the SharePoint admin role and some other admin roles. You should try to have that global admin role, but if you don't, then hopefully you've got the role for where you need it. The other thing is that all of these SharePoint or all these Office 365 products all interact. So having SharePoint admin is great if you just need to do something simple in SharePoint, but not enough if you need to create a new site and that creates a group which does some stuff in Azure AD and does some stuff in Teams and all that. So having a, a high level account is a good idea. Exchange is one where they've explicitly said that you don't need that and you can usually get by as an exchange administrator role. The good news is PowerShell is pretty good about letting you know if you don't have the permissions to do the thing that you're trying to do. You'll get lots of 403s and things like that. Because in the background, it is just web calls. By now, I'm guessing everybody has PowerShell 3.0 or later. I think you need Windows 7 for that. I'm not sure. You can use that PowerShell command there to make sure that you've got it. At the very least, you want to have 5.1, I think, because you want this PS read line module. And that's the thing inside of PowerShell now that gives the color coding to parameters and commandlets and makes it easier for you to figure out what's what and just, just looks prettier. You can, uh, if, so if you don't have Windows 10, you can install that PS read line on whatever OS you've got, though that's probably already taken care of. Your execution policy needs to be remote signed because you're going to be installing some modules from downloading them, like Exchange does that, Skype for Business does that. 
So you want to make sure that that's set in place. And again, that's another one of those issues where if you don't have control over your machine, you might not be able to change that setting. So you'll need to make sure you've got that set up ahead of time. And then finally, to get connected to Office 365 with the MS Online, some of the modules I'm going to talk about in a minute, you need the sign-in assistant installed, and that just greases the wheels. I've honestly never looked into it too much to see really what it does. Microsoft said I needed to install it. I trust them. You know, they seem like uh, honest people. They don't have shifty eyes or anything, so I just install it. Now, once you've got everything installed, you're going to be really excited to get out there and do some things, but we need to talk about passwords first. Again, since we're not on the server and we're not talking directly to memory or to the object model, we need to provide passwords to get in. And passwords are one of those th things in normal life, passwords are, are uh, really frustrating. I hate typing my password. I'm almost at the point now where I'm going to just let the bad guys have whatever they want so I don't have to type my password anymore. And when you first start out with PowerShell with Office 365, passwords get really clumsy and it's easy to take the easy way out and just, just so you can get connected and you can do some things. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some good policies on how to handle passwords. The example you'll see in most blog posts and books and things like that is the whole get credential. So you use get credential, it gives you a pop-up, it asks you for a username and a password, and then you use that to get connected to whatever resource you want to get connected with. Really secure, also really annoying because every single time you run your script, you have to do this. The other problem with that is one of the great benefits of PowerShell is the ability to schedule things and script things and have badges going. And if every script that you run kicks off a prompt that has to have somebody type in the username and password, you don't have that scripting ability. So that doesn't scale very well. Great for small things, but you'll find out pretty quickly you outgrow that. A less annoying way to handle that, but way, way less secure and really just a bad idea, nearly as bad as running with scissors, it's just a horrible idea, is you can put your password in plain text inside of your script and then use that to authenticate against Office 365. Just a horrible idea. If your grandmother's around and she sees you do that, she's definitely going to hit your knuckles with a ruler. That is just a horrible idea because then the password is right there in plain text and anybody that gets a hold of your script can get a hold of your password. Really bad idea. I've got a link below there on how to save credentials in an encrypted file. That works pretty well, and that was my weapon of choice for a long time. So I could run some PowerShell, save my, my password in an encrypted file that only I could decrypt, and only I could decrypt it on the machine I encrypted it on. Somewhat annoying. There were some getting steps to get it set up for other people to use was tricky, but it was pretty secure. I really like that. But then I found uh, this next example. And this is the Windows Credential Manager. This is something that's been built into Windows, the operating system, since I think Windows 8.1. And this is how Windows stores all of your passwords that it remembers for websites and network shares and all of that. I like this for a couple of reasons. I like it because I can just let Windows, let Microsoft worry about storing things securely. And it's, and it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. So I know that every system I'm on, I don't have to worry about things being installed. All of that will be right there. So let's kind of walk through this. There's a couple of ways to do this. Before you can use the, you know, one of the steps is you have to be able to you know, retrieve these passwords and use them. But before you do that, you have to set them up. So we'll, we'll kind of go backwards on that. We'll set one up first. If you are on Windows 10 or I think Windows 8.1, hit the start button and type CRED, start, you know, the, the, the searching. You're going to look for the credential manager. And when that comes up, you can see we've got two sections there, web credentials and Windows credentials. We want to make sure we go into the Windows credentials. And if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see the generic credentials at the bottom. And if you're not in my office, you can't see, but I've got the little laser pointer and I'm circling uh, generic credentials right here. You'll have to take my word for it. And if we want to use one, we want to set one up for the first time, you want to click add generic credential. When you get that dialog box where it says internet or network address, really just put a name there. And that name is something that you're going to use later. So you can put your Office 365 URL in there, but it doesn't do you any good. Put something in there that's easy to type and easy to remember. If you forget what you put, of course, you can always come back to the screen and look down through there. You can see like my admin 518, that's one that I created a few days ago. So put in your Office 365 username, your password. The great thing about this is this can be multiple users. So hopefully in your environment, you've got a regular user that you use to do regular things, read your email. And if you're doing any administrative tasks, you've got an administrative user. So you can have multiple users going to the same tenant, just store them here differently. 
I type the password, hit okay. You can see here, this is how it shows up in there. That's how uh, you verify that it's at. And now when I wanna use that password, I've got a couple of options. There is a module called Credential Manager that we're gonna talk about here in another slide that I can use to grab stored credentials securely from the Credential Manager. So that's what it looks like. And you'll notice that tenant admin name is the same name that I called it when I created it in the Credential Manager. When we start talking about the PNP PowerShell, it also has a commandlet that will pull those stored credentials out. For this one, there's a, a little trip up at the end. You have to specify a type. The PNP understands a bunch of different types of authentication, and so you have to tell it you want a PS credential, and then that will give you what you need. So a couple of slides back, we talked about we could do the my account equals get credential. Now we can do my account equals get stored credential get PNP stored credential. The great news about this is when you write your script, this is what you would have in the script. As long as that stored credential is on the machine the script gets run on, it'll just pull it out of there and you can securely connect to all of your resources. This was a game changer for me as a consultant. I work on a lot, a lot of different environments and as a lot of different users and this, uh, this really made things a lot easier for me. And I have a blog post on it and I can't believe I didn't uh, gratuitously put a, a link in there. If you go to toddclint.com slash posh, it'll list all my blog posts on PowerShell and you can, that's one of them will show up in there. This is the credential manager that I talked about. This is a module. That link there will get it from the PowerShell gallery. You can download that. This has a couple of examples. I, we showed the one where I could pull the stored credential, but you can also use this to create stored credentials. So I actually have a group of PowerShell that I use to create users in my demo tenants. And then when I, after the users exist in my demo tenants, and I have another piece of PowerShell that creates all the stored credentials for those users. So if you're doing any kind of testing, this is an easy way to do it. One, uh, a couple of notes about this. I don't cover it in here, but every PowerShell session should start with the command let start transcript, which keeps a log of all the things you type and all the things that PowerShell says back. If you have that running, and you should, you'll notice that the password that you put in here to create that stored credential is in plain text, in clear text. So you'll wanna make sure you go into that, trans uh, that tra uh, transcript file and remove that. So that's one trip up. The second one is if you don't use this persist parameter, it will not save that stored credential outside of this window. So then you'll store your credential, you use it, you'll feel like the smartest person alive. When you close this PowerShell window, it won't be there anymore. You'll start it back up, you'll do it again, it'll take you a while to figure this out. You wanna do the persist local machine and that will save it back in there. And again, I've got a PowerShell uh, uh, blog post on how to use all of that. Before we step on, we've also got a little bit about MFA, multi-factor authentication. You can also use this with PowerShell, it's a little trickier. You need to enable MFA at the tenant level, which if you, you know, haven't done that, you don't care about any of this, so that's obviously already been put in place. And then there's a link there on a knowledge base article on how to create an app password for your account. These passwords, these app passwords are generated for applications or whatever that don't understand the new modern auth system that Office 365 uses, but they also work for PowerShell. So in this example, my tenant uh, enabled MFA, my account was enabled for MFA, and then I went in to my account and created an app password and this is what it looked like. I named it Outlook, but I could have named it anything. I could have named it PowerShell or Susan, it doesn't matter. And then I can use this password to log in as my user. So this would be the one that I would store in my credentials. Works like a champ. This is for Office 365 Azure AD MFA. If you're using something else like Ping or Okta or whatever, you'll have to find out from them if they do add passwords, but that would work as well. So that's the authentication piece. I see in the Q&A, uh, Greg has a question, does this include PowerShell Core? I will not be talking about PowerShell Core because as far as I know, PowerShell Core does not support all the Office 365 uh, modules. So I just use the regular Windows PowerShell. Greg has a question, can I grab my stored credentials to a variable for a kickoff start transcript and then use it later? You can, Greg. Grabbing the stored credentials does not cause a transcript issue saving the stored credentials do. So if you use this piece of code right here and create stored credentials with PowerShell, the new stored credential commandlet here makes you put your password in plain text. That's the thing that causes problems in the transcript. If you already have it in there because you created it in Windows or you did this you know, two years ago or whenever, get stored credential does not cause a problem with the transcript, so you're fine. 
Now that we've got our credentials figured out, we've got all the prerequisites installed, we've got credentials saved in a very secure manner, now we need to connect. So now we're gonna start talking through the different modules that Microsoft has. This one is for Azure AD, so this is users, groups, passwords, things like that. Office 365 uses Azure AD as its authentication mechanism in the background, so you can't do anything with Office 365 without being able to understand this bit right here. For maximum confusion, Microsoft has two, call it two and a half modules that take care of authentication. The old timey one is MS Online, they call that V1 sometimes. It all works, there's not like, you know, version errors or anything like that, it just doesn't have all the support for all the, the functionality that Azure AD has, the other module, but the MS Online one is still the one that I use the most probably because I've been using it the longest, but it does most of the things that I like. And then also there are some, there's some functionality that it does better. Licensing, for instance, is much easier with MS Online than it is with the Azure AD module. But here's how you get connected with it. So I've got a get stored credential called tenant admin that we created a couple slides back. I pull it in, oh, I should, uh, I need a, a, a carriage break in there, let me, well, so type uh, PS credential and then that connect MSOL service credential uses that credential and I'm actually gonna fix that right now. And you don't need to see all that uh, so that this slide makes a little more sense for you. Um, but then we would connect with that, let me save that and do a shift F5. There we go, that makes a whole lot more sense. So we're gonna pull the stored credential out that we created a couple slides ago, then we're going to connect MSOL service with that credential. All of these modules, when they do uh, connects, subscribe to the idea that no news is good news. So if you do the connect and nothing happens, then that's probably good and it probably got all connected. For myself, I'm a little squeamish, so I like to do something, like in this case, get MSOL user, which will tell me what users are in there, and then I know that it's connected and I know that it's good. Once you've got that set up, then you can use something like uh, get command to find out what modules are in there and that the module name is MS Online. This is what I was talking about earlier where when I started using PowerShell, I just needed ideas on what to do. Running get command and seeing all the commands that are in this module is where those juices start get, get flowing. So I highly recommend that just to see what's, uh, what's in there. Another way to get to the same place is using the Azure AD command uh, module. So I've got an example of that below. For that one, instead of using a stored credential, I decided to use get credential just to show that it doesn't matter how you get the credential. As long as you get a valid Office 365 credential, you can get in. I use that credential. I use connect Azure AD instead of connect MSOL. Again, because I want to make sure everything's in there, I do a get Azure AD user and just make sure my users come in and then do a get, uh, get command to see what's in that module. In most cases, if there is an MSOL and an Azure AD commandlet to do the same thing, like getting users, they're going to be named similarly, not always. And you'll notice that Microsoft used pretty good PowerShell discipline here and they've added a, a prefix to their noun. So it's not get user, it's get MSOL user. It's not get user, it's get Azure AD user. And if they follow good principles, all of the commands in this module will have the prefix MSOL or Azure AD. And that's an easy way to tell where something comes from. You can have, and you will have, multiple modules installed in your PowerShell host at the same time. And that's one good way for you to be able to tell where a command came from. There's other ways, but that's a, a pretty easy one. So this gets you into doing things like creating users, setting passwords, and this is an example that I really like from setting, uh, setting passwords. I had a situation where I needed to change all of the passwords in one of my Azure AD tenants. So I went out to PowerShell and did, you know, get help or get command star password star. Sure enough, set MSOL passwords in there. I did the thing that I always do, then I hit up arrow, I hit examples, and I saw an example. Yep, that's exactly what I want to do. Because of what I was trying to do, I needed to change all of my passwords at once. And so then I used some of the, the great power in PowerShell. I did a get MSOL user, and then I piped that through set MSOL user password, gave it the new password, got no errors, and thought I was the smartest man alive. The downside of this is it did exactly what I told it to do, and it changed all of my passwords, including all of my service accounts and everything like that. So I broke Azure AD Connect synchronization. I broke a bunch of things. So be careful with this, don't do this at home, but these are some of the kind of wholesale things that you can do with piping and all of that with these modules. 
So that gets you set up with your users. Skype for Business is another module that you may end up using when you connect to Office 365. This one is a little squirrely. Uh, it, you have to install it and the install is really ugly. Uh, so I've got the notes in my slide here. It was like 10 steps and it required a reboot, which is just ridiculous this day and age. But that got me connected. That was one of the things that I disliked about this module. The second thing that I disliked about this module is the product Skype for Business has been called many things over the years. It was LCS, OCS, all kinds of things. And the commandlets reflect that, so they're not always consistent on what they call the product name. So as you're looking through the, the get command and trying to find a, a, a command that does something, keep that in mind. The other thing, you're probably saying to yourself, man, nobody uses Skype for Business anymore. I'm never gonna have to do this. The current version of this is a product called Teams. Maybe you've heard of it. And there are more than 50 commandlets in the Skype for Business module that deal with Teams settings. And they are important team settings like are guests allowed to be presenters, things like that. So hopefully you will not have to do battle with this particular module. But if you do, you're going to want to set aside some time, some reboots. If there's any antidepressants handy, you're going to want to keep them closer with a glass of water. This was way uglier than I expected. And I was on a phone with a customer and I was in a meeting, a Teams meeting, and I wanted to share my screen and I couldn't because I was a guest. I'm like, oh, this is super simple. We should just do this in PowerShell. Like six days later, I had no hair. It was horrible. But this is, this is one way. And this one's weird also because you do the import session thing. We're just not used to doing it with SharePoint. But spend a lot, make sure you allot some time for this one. You, uh, when you have to do this one. Exchange is another one that's a little different than we're used to with SharePoint. Again, you do the connect and you bring the session in. This is you know, creating mailboxes, managing mailboxes. Probably don't care a lot about that. I only left this in so that you could see how it is different than SharePoint and, and some of the other ones, but this is in here. They tell you that it's limited to three sessions. I have not ever seen that enforced, but you should be a good, good internet citizen or remove your session when you uh, are, are using this one or the Skype for Business one. And Greg, uh, thanks for breaking things and then sharing your experiences. Greg, I break a lot of things. Uh, one of my favorite ones, and I, I can't remember the short URL for it on my blog, but I was using PowerShell with an on-prem server and I was trying to pull the name of all of my databases and I screwed up the logic and instead of getting the name, I was looking for specific database SharePoint config. Instead, I renamed all of my databases SharePoint config. That was a bad day at the Clint house, but I'm happy to share those experiences because that's, that's a great way to learn. So happy that you guys enjoy that. Probably the reason that most of us are here is SharePoint. That's the thing that brings us all together. Microsoft has a module for SharePoint Online, and I used to give this one a hard time. Back in the day, this was really bad. When I first started doing this particular session, this module had 31 commandlets, which is not a lot. If you look at like SharePoint Server now, SharePoint Server 2019, 800 and some commandlets, 860 I think the last time I looked. By way of comparison, the 32 that this one brought to the table was pretty weak. Now we're up over 150, and it actually does a bunch of uh, interesting functions. One thing that I like to tell people, and this commandlet is a, a this module is a great example of that, is that new cool functionality always comes to PowerShell first. When Multigeo and Hub Sites, when that when those came out. The first, when they, when they first came out, the only way you could turn them on, the only way you could interact with them was PowerShell. Site scripts, site designs, right now we're at the same spot where the best way to do everything, and the only way to do everything, is with PowerShell. All the new th functionality comes to PowerShell. The reason for this is twofold. Number one, all of this ends up in a, a UI at some point, for the most part. But to get these settings in the UI takes a lot of work. You have to decide which page it goes into, you know, which of the many uh, portals it goes to, where, where it's at, what it looks like when the, the you know, page is viewed in a desktop as opposed to a tablet, as opposed to a phone. Really complicated. In PowerShell, you just make a new command look, or you add a parameter to a command look. Easy peasy. The other thing that PowerShell adds is when you add it to the interface, it has to be internationalized. It has to be translated in all 426 languages or whatever that Microsoft supports. When they put it in PowerShell, it's just in English. 
So if for no other reason than because you want to play with the new functionality when it comes out, you should get comfortable with SharePoint uh, PowerShell now and get it installed and poke around with it. So when the new functionality comes out, you can just jump in and play with that instead of having to do battle with PowerShell itself. When this module first came out, it had a download, and I've got a link there for that. You can download it. It's an MSI, run it, install it. I've not had great luck with that, uh, spe specifically with upgrading it because new versions come out fairly frequently, once a month-ish, once every other month. But if you're in a situation where you want to do that, you can install it with that link. They have also recently added it to the PowerShell gallery, and that is that uh, line down there. If you're in a admin PowerShell window, you can run install module with that name. It will pull the current version of that module down from the PowerShell gallery. And then it opens up all of the other PowerShell gallery functionality like upgrading and things like that. I have not had great luck upgrading this with the PowerShell gallery either. In most cases, the only way I've ever been able to upgrade this is uninstalling it everywhere that I can find it, going through the registry and removing access or references to it, and going into the file system and removing it. It's really been ugly. Now, there's a good chance that that's just because I'm not very smart, but it also could be because this is just not written real well. We have so many modules for Office 365 because these modules are not written by the PowerShell team. They're written by the product team. So the people who wrote this module don't know PowerShell very well. They know SharePoint really well. And because of that, you get all these little odd situations. PowerShell issues that have been solved for a long time, but nobody in this group knows that because they don't do PowerShell. So you have to uh, you know, budget some time for, for that. Uh, and I think this one gets updated once a month and it should be soon. So I'll have to go through that process again. When we connect, this is what this looks like. This is much like going to central admin. This is the PowerShell version of going to central admin in Office 365. So uh, we've got this familiar connect like we had with uh, MSOL and Azure AD. We're using that same my account. So that could have been from get stored uh, credential. That could have been from get credential. It doesn't matter. We can pass it all that way. If you pass nothing, it will prompt you. The thing to keep in mind here is that we're connecting at the tenant level and we're connecting to the tenant admin URL. So you'll see get URL HTTPS tenant dash admin and you're good in that way. And then once it connects again, no news is good news. So I do something like get SPO site that gives me a list of all the site collections in my tenant. And then I know that it's connected, get module, it gets all that. So this is good for the multi-geo settings, moving sites between multi-geo, setting up site designs, setting up site scripts, manipulating, um, some of those other things, hubs, hub sites, that's all, uh, all in there. Uh, so, so Greg is saying that he's uh, been able to uninstall the SPO PowerShell and then install the new version. He's done this a bunch of times. Greg, I'm gonna have to have you come over and do mine. I don't, I don't know where you're at, how quickly you can get over here, but I've got a couple of machines I've been having problems with. So if you'd, uh, if you'd come over, that would be, that would be awesome. I've got a Keurig, we can make coffee, be a good time. Yeah, but this is one of those where you do the get command and it's just going to open up all kinds of ideas on what you can do with it. A fairly new addition to the, 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 uh, the PowerShell stable here is Teams. So this came out a little over a year ago. You can do install module Microsoft Teams and that will bring those things down. I've got some examples of this later, but this is you know, managing all of your team settings. Hopefully, we, some of those Skype for business modules that I've had or commands that I've had to use to manage teams will, will show up in here. I haven't checked lately to see if they're all in there, but this is another one to add when you're doing any kind of teams management. I haven't done a bunch with this, but it's good that it's there because we definitely, we need that. Flow and Power Apps, not only do they have their own module, they have two modules. And I feel like this is sort of the epitome of a group writing this that has no idea what to do in PowerShell. I wasn't there when this happened, but I feel like there were no adults in the room when this module was written. They wrote this module, these modules in such a way that there is one module for admins, one module for not admins or creators, which is ugly enough. But then... Uh, those two modules have some of the same commands. So when you install them, you have to allow the second one to clobber the first one. So it's important that you install them in the correct order and that you do the allow clobber switch for the non-admin uh, module. It's really ugly. And if you don't use the, so at the bottom there, I've got the PowerShell gallery method, which is a, the preferred way to do it. 
if you do, if you want to install them manually, there's a link to a, a blog post that talks about how to install them. It might be the worst install I've ever seen. There were fewer reboots than the Skype for Business install, but honest to God, the last time I installed this not from the gallery, you had to download a zip file and unload the zip file and like rename some DLLs and register them. It was, it was a mess. So you should always try it from the, the gallery first and it'll get those down there. Um, there, there, if you haven't played with power, uh, apps or flow, they're in the process now trying to figure out the licensing for this. And if you're an admin, you're going to need a power apps plan to license or a trial license. If you want to play with it to get some of that functionality. And when I get to the examples here at the end, we'll talk about, uh, what you can do with those, but there, there might be some licensing considerations with this one. Hmm. Here I left a note for myself a couple of versions of the slide deck ago that I needed to add a slide on groups and then I added the slide on groups and didn't change the title. So I no longer need to add a slide on groups. This is that slide. Groups is new functionality, newish functionality. It's actually been in the product for four years now, but it hasn't really been one that's taken off a lot. I, I put the slide in because there is no module on groups because groups isn't a product. You manage groups from other modules, so that can be with the MSOL Azure ones, or from Exchange, or the PNP, which we're gonna talk about later, Teams is another way to do it. So as you have these groups tasks that you wanna do, don't look for the groups module because there is not one. You can use, uh, you have to use the other ones. And another way that you can do it is Azure AD has uh, a graph, Azure AD for graph, and I forget exactly which version of the Azure AD module there is, uh, has support for that, and that's one way to pull things in and out. So uh, when, you have, when you have your groups. Now, I mentioned earlier, but I'm never one to miss an opportunity to shamelessly self-promote. Uh, if you go to syskit.com or go to my blog, I'm doing a webinar much like this one next week on groups, and I will talk about a whole bunch of the different uh, PowerShell things that I do with groups in that session. That is the end of the Microsoft modules. You will need all of those. I talked badly about many of them and it's all well-deserved, but you're gonna have to have them all. So as you're setting up your workstation, oh, and I've got, a, uh, hmm, I've got another slide. I've got a blog post that I recently put out that has a list of all of the modules that Microsoft has and the third-party ones and um, how to install. So let me pull that up here quick. I thought I had a slide on that in here and I don't, uh, I don't see it. So let me pull that up. But that is, the idea behind that is it's going to be a one-stop shop for you when you're setting up new machines or you're curious about which modules you need to install, what they look like, how to get them. Uh, that is this. So let me. Uh, so you just go to tyclint.com slash blog and that will get you to here. This is all of the modules that we've just talked about, MSOL, both of the Azure AD. I mentioned that there were kind of two and a half. So there's MSOL, there's Azure AD, and then there's a preview of the next Azure AD. This is what the, the version was the last time I checked, and I've got a thing in my calendar to check again today because a couple have been updated. What version is uh, current? So you can go in here and see all of your modules and what version, and you can compare it here to see if you need to upgrade. And then if you do need to upgrade or install, that is the command there that will do it. And that's for all of the ones that we've talked about. And then some of the third party ones, the credential manager one, the PNP that we're going to talk about in a minute. But that's a pretty good resource for that. I've had that in OneNote forever. And then finally, somebody's like, hey, you should, you should blog that. So it was a pretty easy one. I just, just copied it out. If you have any ideas on how I could improve that, if there's information that's not in there, whatever, uh, send me a tweet, leave me a comment, whatever. So third party options, because Office 365 is just web connections, a long time ago, before all these modules existed, some clever developers wrote their own modules in PowerShell using CSOM, the client side object model, because that's what's going on in the background. Those were dark days, folks. Be very glad that we are not living in that world now. When we did that, you had to copy DLLs around or install SDKs, it's horrible. This is an example of what I had to do. Again, this was you know five or six years ago. That top of script was what I used to get connected. So it would be the analogous, you know, connect SPO online or SPO service we have now. And since the SPO commandlets, the smallest prop or the smallest object that it deals with is a site collection, I had to write something and by write, I mean steal some code that would get me the subwebs of that site collection. 
and we'll look at what that looked like in a second here. So this 22 lines right here is what it took to connect. So you can see username, password, URL, all that. This 22 lines is the what we had to do that was equal to connect SPO service today. So we've come a long way. And this is what I had to do to get the list of the subwebs, another, you know, 20 some lines. This is horrible. I bring this up so that we can fully appreciate, number one, what's going on in the background. It is all just web calls, but also so that we can fully appreciate uh, the patterns and practices that we're going to talk about now. And this is a woman right now learning about the patterns and practices on her phone for the first time. And you can just see from that smile how much she's, she's looking forward to it. She's going to love it. So this is the patterns and practices PowerShell for you know the most alliteration possible. The Patterns and Practices project came out of Microsoft a few years ago to give developers patterns and practices on how to develop against SharePoint. They wanted to make sure that people weren't doing bad things to SharePoint and Office 365. And one of the things that they wanted to demonstrate was how to write PowerShell commands. So they wrote a couple that showed the powers, the, the patterns and practices that developers should use, and it got very popular and kind of grew to be a, a life of its own. Uh, Greg in the chat room is saying, am I saying CSOM is no longer useful? No, CSOM is what everything that everybody writes in uh, SharePoint is. I'm just saying we don't need to use it anymore to use PowerShell. We can do the patterns and practices uh, stuff now. You can still write CSOM PowerShell if you'd like. If that's, uh, if that's something that, uh, if you've got something that works that way, you can certainly do it. The Patterns and Practices PowerShell is in GitHub. It's a community project, so you can go out there, you can clone it and fork it. I have no idea what any of those words mean. That's all developer speak, but it's all out there. You can see all the code. As of this month or last month, it had over 390 commands. It just does everything. It works with all of the different versions of SharePoint. We're gonna talk about SharePoint Online because right now it is the coolest, but any version of on-prem SharePoint that supports CSOM, supports uh, some or all of these commandlets. So we're talking 2013, 2016, uh, 2010 to, a, to a, a small degree, and I think 2019 is soon to be supported. So if you still have on-prem servers, you can use it for that. This one, unlike MSOL, which is you, know, you connect at the tenant level or the, the SPO module you connect at the, the tenant level, this one connects at the site collection level. So that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a bad thing in that it's tough to make a script that connects to everything because then which site collection do you use to connect with this? And also because if you're used to using the other ones, then you forget what context you're in and you have to connect a bunch of times. It takes some getting used to, but it's not that bad, but it's just not the way you're used to connecting. But the good thing about it is anybody can use it and they don't have to be an admin. Again, this is using CSOM. It's using all the same code that web parts use and all that. So as long as somebody has permission to get to a site collection or to edit a page, they can run the patterns and practices of PowerShell and do that. So now you really have the ability to write tools for other people to use. And as you make your way through PowerShell uh, doing things, there's kind of a, a very natural progression where you start with you know, running single command lists to get information, and then you bolt a couple of them together and pipe, and then you get some, some fun things happening there. And then you write these really complicated one-liners that barely work, and then you have to make you know, multiple, you have to write a PS1 file. At some point, hopefully you will transition from being the tool user to the tool maker. And the fact that this PowerShell connects at the site collection level makes it really easy for you to write tools as a tool maker for tool users to use because it can be anybody in your organization. It doesn't have to be IT. Anybody uh, that wants to run PowerShell and you know, do whatever, this connects at the site collection level. So as long as they're a site collection administrator, they can get in. This is a great uh, project. This is as indispensable as any of the other modules that I've talked about so far today. This is just a, a must have. This slide was really just, again, some grease to kind of get you thinking about the different tasks that you can perform with the PNP PowerShell. I, I mentioned that it's my favorites because it's ones that I've used over time, and we'll talk about some of these in, in later slides. Now, when it, so I've got a blog post, and I was just looking at it yesterday that I need to go back on, how to upload a file to SharePoint. And it's multiple lines of code, and the first time I published it, I screwed it up because it wasn't real intuitive. Now with the PNP PowerShell, add PNP file. There's a single line you connect and it just goes, uh, it goes through and just, just works. If you want to download one, you've got get PNP PowerShell. It just downloads a file. Move them, rename them, all those things. If you want to write a script that will bulk check in or check out files, 
there's a command for that. Create lists, modify lists, list items, permissions, add or remove views, add or remove fields, uh, restore PNP recycle bin item. We're going to talk about that in a couple of minutes. That's, I've got a great story about that. And then some of the Office 365 group management that I talked about, new groups, get groups. We're going to talk about that in a minute as well. Mike Zimmerman in the chat room says, will you be showing how to run a PS1 file for more complicated things versus just single line commandlets? Yeah, sort of, Mike. I'm going to show here when we get to the examples, those will all be multiple, well, not all, but a lot of them will be multiple line things. I don't go through saving PS1 files and how to make that work, but if you've got questions about that, Mike, uh, hit me up and I'm happy to, uh, happy to get you going on that. One of the things that I used to run across, though not as much anymore, the world is a more enlightened place than it was uh, a year, year and a half ago, was that this PNP PowerShell doesn't come directly from Microsoft. And I had a couple of my customers that would push back against this. They, they, they liked the ones that came from Microsoft. They seemed to be blessed, but this one that just anybody who can get into GitHub can write seemed scary. The last, I got that feedback from a customer that denied because I wrote a script that used this, they wouldn't run it. And I just happened to be at a conference with Erwin Van Heunen, who is the non-Microsoft person that is in charge of this. Vesa Juvenen, who is a senior product program manager for SharePoint at Microsoft, is, is the one who owns all this. And he's the big daddy, but Erwin is the guy who does most of the work. And he works at a company called Rencore. So I happened to be at an event with Erwin the week after I uh, got that feedback. And so I mentioned it to him and he had heard that a lot and he gave me a very, we'll call it passionate response. And that's really what this slide is. All the reasons why you should trust the PNP PowerShell. It uses the same API and CSOM that every other SharePoint code does. It doesn't get around security in any way, shape or form. Again, Vesa is the guy that owns it. And if it was doing bad stuff, uh, you know, it would, it would be bad for Vesa, probably cost him his job. So that's not gonna be the case. Starting in November of 2017, the module when you download it is signed with Microsoft's key. Like there is no higher you know, blessing in PowerShell than that. Microsoft themselves are saying uh, you can do it. And then one of the things, and I, I saw Erwin a couple of weeks ago and I got an updated number on this, but I've forgotten it. But at that time when I talked to him in 2017, he said that the PNP PowerShell hits the Office 365 API a billion times a month. So this isn't some crazy thing that Todd Clint stumbled across in one of the dark uh, corners of the internet and likes to use. This is a legitimate tool that everybody uses. So hopefully you'll never have this conversation, but uh, if you do, you can use this slide. Mike asks in the chat room, all the favorites you have, can anyone run or just admins? I think it was anyone. It depends on the command, Mike. So the PNP PowerShell, these can be run by anybody that has permission to what they're connecting to, and this connects to the site collection level. Uh, the other ones, it depends on whether they have permission again, what they're connecting to. So you can run the Exchange one if you're an Exchange admin. You can run the SharePoint one if you're a SharePoint admin. It just uh, depends. When we get to the flow and Power Apps examples, you can run those as regular users, depending on what you're trying to get. So it depends on each module. I told you that I thought I added a slide for this, and I was right, I did. I just forgot where I added it. <laughs> so here's how you can keep up with all of the different modules that I've talked about. Uh, it's all the stuff from the, the blog post that I just showed you. At the top, I've got that set repository. If you run that first and you say, we trust the PowerShell gallery, the PS gallery, then when you run all those installs, you don't have to say, yes, I trust the repository. Yes, I still trust the repository. Again, with the trusting the repository. If you do that thing at the top first, then it will just install. That's all of them that I talked about. And look at that, even a screenshot of my blog post and a link to it. So that's that. Again, I'm gonna to try to update that. I have done a thing that I've been threatening to do for a while in a lot of my blog posts, the information at the time I wrote it was eh, mostly correct. But then as time goes on and the product changes, that, that becomes less and less correct. So for this blog post, I did something I've been threatening to do for a while. I put a monthly reminder in my Outlook to go out to this blog post and see if it's still current. So hopefully I will be able to keep all those, uh, those modules uh, uh, up to date. Mike's asking, uh, I was wondering about just SharePoint things like creating lists and uploading files. Yes, if you have a regular user, if you've got Jim in accounting and he wants to upload 400 spreadsheets to the accounting site collection, you can absolutely write him a PowerShell script that uses the PNP that authenticates as Jim from accounting and uploads all those things into his site collection. That's a good, uh, 
a good example of something to do for that. Speaking of examples, let's spend our last 10 minutes looking through some examples. For the most part, these are all examples of things that I've had to do for customers. So here is one, and it's like the, the example that I just gave Mike. Here's just uploading a file. So I've got a, a web that is, uh, that, so this is HR here. So I've got, the, you know, connecting to a specific site collection. This doesn't show, I guess it does show the, the web connection there. I'm just connecting as Megan B. Megan B is just a regular HR person. And she wants to upload a file, a document to the shared folders library. So she runs this. This one is notable because the add PNP file commandlet has a folder parameter that isn't really a folder. So we think about shared documents being a document library and then a document library may or may not have folders. So we can think about not needing a folder parameter for this if we're just putting it in root. But the way the PNP PowerShell has to build its queries in the background, it looks at the document library name as the root of the folder. So I had to create a folder variable called shared documents to drop it in the shared to drop it in the root of the shared documents library. But Megan can run this with nothing but permissions at that site collection and she can uh, she can run that. What if she wants to create a folder and or upload a uh, create a folder and then upload a file. So this is what the folder that we normally think about is. So she wants to add PNP folder, cleverly name it folder 1. And then when she uploads her next document, that folder parameter is a little ugly because it's got the folder value that is shared documents and then folder one. So these, and this is one, um, I've used these for a, a number of things. A lot of this has been really cruddy migration scenarios where people have documents that weren't in SharePoint before. They don't want to buy a tool, so they just want to upload a bunch of documents into a bunch of places. I've, I've been able to cobble together some scripts that do that. I look in the, the, the Windows file system, I see a folder, so I run the add PMP folder, copy the files over, that kind of thing. Pretty handy for that. This was another example that I had from a customer. They wanted to find out which files were shared. Office 365 makes it really easy to share files. But Office 365 makes it really easy to share files and really easy to lose track of where those are, are, are shared. This is not a, an exhaustive way to do it because there's a, a bunch of different places that you can share folders, share, share files and it's stored in different places. This will only show you where they are stored internally. So if you're an on-prem person, this is like breaking inheritance and adding permission to something. But this was a, a, an iterative step in that thing that they wanted. So again, I'm connecting just as Megan B, just typical, you know, HR uh, lackey. I'm going through and I'm getting a list of all the doc libs. So I'm using get PNP list. Remember the document library in SharePoint is just a list, but it's a list of documents. So I'm using get PNP list, but I'm going to filter some of these out. So first off, I want the default U view URL and whether it's a system list, because these requests are going over the web and not just hitting the object model like we're used to a SharePoint server, the API, both server and client side, tries to be as efficient as possible. So it doesn't bring down every piece of information it knows about every single thing out there because then the payload would be huge, take a lot of network bandwidth. So there are a few places where we have to specifically tell PowerShell what properties to bring down. This is one of them. Or I say I want the default view URL and I want the property of whether it's a system list. So I tell it to include that. And then I filter that and I say, okay, where the property is system list is false. So I don't want any of these system uh, document libraries because I don't care if that stuff's shared. It probably isn't shared. And then I only want the lists or libraries that have the base type of document library. So I want to remove all the lists, calendar lists, contact lists, and all that. And I want to assign all that to the doc libs variable. And then I just walk through that and I say for every uh, document library in that list, I want to get the list items. And for every item in that particular document library that I'm going to, if the shared with users property on that document is not equal to null, so it does have a value, then I want to write out what the name of the um, document is. So that's the field values file ref file reference, and the email address of the user that's shared with. So this is really ugly output. And the thing that I ended up, you know, turning into the customer was something much more elegant than this. But this just gave me all of the, the lists, the, the, the documents and the users. It's kind of, again, to get you excited about uh, what you can do. 
This one was another uh, example from that same customer. They said, you did such a good job with the shared uh, information. Now write us one that spits out all of the content types and compliance tags. So I did a similar thing. I'm connecting again for any user that has permission in site collection. I'm grabbing all the same document libraries, not the system ones, not the ones that are just lists. Walking through, this one I'm grabbing a title because that's gonna be part of what I output. And uh, I had to do a simple, th another thing now. When I did get PNP doc lib, or get PNP list, it has an includes parameter. So I could specify the properties that I wanted that weren't by there by default. Get PNP list item does not have that. So what I had to do is I had to use another, per, another uh, PNP command like get PNP property and pass all of my objects through and say, pull down the file content type and compliance info property, because those were not included by default. And then I just walk through them all and just spit out some output. This one, instead of just splatting it out to the screen, I created a custom object and, uh, and put that out there. So that was another good one. A uh, couple minutes left, so I'm gonna kind of scoot through these last few slides. This one was a case where I had a customer who had a user that deleted a few uh, was 90 some thousand files and didn't tell anybody right away and tried to upload them by herself because she was embarrassed and then realized she wasn't going to be able to do it. So they had a very specific thing they wanted from me. They wanted me to recover all of the recycle bin items where the object was a JPEG, where it was from a specific folder in that site collection and where it was uh, deleted by a very specific person because a bunch of people were in there. So that's what that first, you know, bin equals was get the recycle bin item and filter out through all of those things. I did the bin dot count just to see how many there were. When I started this, there was 93,000, something like that. So then my first foray to get them all restored was to do that for each loop. What I found was that that was going to take several days to run because it was slow. So then I broke it down and ran it in multiple windows and on multiple machines and did it in chunks of like five and 10,000 at a time. It just took a few hours at that point. So that's, uh, again, there's a blog post there, but that's a good one on how to restore things and how to filter uh, responses back. If you want to create a new SharePoint site, an Office 365 group, the next couple of slides talk about what does and doesn't work. If you do new SPO site, it creates a regular SharePoint site, but no group, no team. You have to groupify it later. If you use the PNP one and say, I want to create a modern team site, it creates a group, but it doesn't create the team. So you have to teamify it later, which means going into teams, say a new team, picking a group that you're an owner of, and then adding a team to it. But if you use the team module and do new team, then it does everything. It creates the SharePoint group and the email stuff and all of that. Uh, so as you're you know, thinking about scripting things out, knowing which one does what is pretty uh, important. One of the things that we don't have in SharePoint Online is the whole idea of save site as a template, but the Office of uh, the PNP PowerShell has a provisioning engine. And so we can use that to essentially save site as template. It's not quite the simple because there's a whole lot of knobs to twist and buttons to push and all that. But essentially you can get a PNP provisioning template from an existing site and then apply it to another site and it will uh, do all that. Site scripts and site designs are probably a better way to do this now, but this is, uh, this is one way to do it. Um, this example is really long and I only have a minute left, but I, this is a blog post you can go through. This copies Office 365 groups. The thing here is to show that you have to connect to the graph to do that and just some other things. Hit that blog post if you're curious about that. I wanted to mention this one, the flow and Power Apps one. This one gets you all the flows, so you run get admin flow. It doesn't give you the user names, though it pulls back the GUIDs for the user, so you have to have the MSOL user module in there to pull that out to names, but this gets all the flows in your tenant, which is handy if you have people leaving and you want to know what's where. If you're just a regular user, you can just do get flow as opposed to get admin flow and it lists all of your individual flows and what its name is. Uh, if you want to disable the flow button, this doesn't disable the flow functionality, but just the button. There's a couple of ways to do that with SPO or PNP, but again, crafty users can just go to flow and connect their flows. If you want to get the Power Apps, this is uh, one way to get your own Power Apps. And then there's a Get Admin Power Apps, I believe, as well. It is 1 o'clock. Here's how to contact me. Um, Christian, back to you. Thanks so much for your time today, Tom. It was my pleasure. 
Uh, I, I, if there's any final questions in the waning seconds here, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll capture and pass along any, any questions, but uh, thanks for, uh, for uh, presenting today and everybody for participating and we're yeah. recording the recording. We'll capture this and we'll post it out to uh, YouTube and, and uh, let everybody know as well. So you can uh, continue to promote this goodness. Yeah, and again, I see a lot of people there. I see a lot of familiar faces. But if you've got any questions about any of this, don't be shy. I'm a pretty friendly guy. So just uh, hit me up. Happy to help out. All right. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. And, uh, you know, thanks, Todd. And we'll uh, let everybody get back to their day. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.